So welcome everybody. Welcome to this round table event. Uh, it's really nice to see you all here. I've just been texting with uh, My name is Timothy Large. I am the uh, Director of Independent Media Programs at the International Press Institute of Vienna. And we're really thrilled to have all of you in the room and also the people watching from afar with these cameras in the back of the room. So thank you so much for your time. This is becoming a little bit of an annual event in the sense that we had a, a round table, slightly similar round table in Vienna last year at the World Congress, where we talked about uh, the role that philanthropy can play in supporting independent media. And that conversation went many different places. And one of the conclusions really was that while there are no silver bullets, one thing that philanthropy can do is to catalyze and unlock uh, other forms of capital to support independent media. And one of those forms is investment or impact investment. So today, that is what we'd like to drill down into uh, with our incredible uh, number of speakers from the philanthropic world, from foundations, from the investment world, and of course, from the media organizations themselves. So thank you very much for taking part. Uh, we'd like to just have a few uh, introductory words from our partners uh, at Media Impact Founders and Global Forum for Media Development. So let me hand you over to Vince. Hi all, I'm Vince Staley, Executive Director of Media Impact Funders. And uh, thanks Tim and Mira for, uh, and everyone associated with this in incredibly impressive assembly for inviting us to, to join you in this effort. Um, it's an honor for Media Impact Funders to contribute to this special roundtable on investment opportunities to support independent journalism. Uh, in recent years, there's been a really big increase in philanthropic support for journalism uh, in recognition of the important role. Yeah, okay. Well, yeah, thanks. Uh, in, in recognition of the important role that media and journalism play in a healthy democracy, and the increasingly perilous state of local journalism. So in our most recent report on grant funding for journalism, we saw foundation grants for journalism quadruple from 2009, uh, when 300 funders made $69 million in grants to just over 300 organizations. Uh, and by 2017, more than 1,200 funders made over 255 million grants to 925 organizations. And then, of course, the, the numbers have only increased since then. Uh, we really need to update that report, but I can say informally, by 2019, 1,366 funders made $332 million in journalism grants to about 1,500 organizations. So you can see it's a pretty steep growth on that side of the equation. And meanwhile, uh, over the same period of time, philanthropy has also embraced mission investing, and the entire field of impact investing has exploded as financial markets have become much more sensitive to the social impact of economic activity. So what has lagged, I think, at least up until now, is a connection between these two trends. And hopefully with what we learned today, um, we can illuminate the path where philanthropy can see that there are really great opportunities for mission investments in an industry where there are still strong and sustainable revenues um, that merit consideration for investment. Um, and so listening to the opening session yesterday uh, and looking at the entire program of the IPI World Congress here today, um, we're reminded that authoritarians depend upon control and capture of media outlets and companies, and that does not happen overnight. So philanthropy needs to wake up to its obligations and opportunities in providing the investment capital for media companies that will sustain independent journalism and democracies uh, th that democracies require. So thank you for allowing us to help convene this effort. Thank you, Tim, and thank you, Vincent. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, not much to add after uh, these two warm welcomes. Um, my name is Mir Milosevic. I'm the executive director of the Global Forum for Media Development. 
We are a network of uh, organizations that support media and journalists in more than 170 countries around the world. Uh, we have around 130 members who work together uh, to invest in media, to support their safety, uh, training, uh, and also their long-term sustainability. Um, one of the most exciting uh, parts of this conversation is um, for us, the cooperation. Cooperation between organizations like Media Impact Funders, uh, International Press Institute, and uh, uh, all of you uh, here today. Uh, on our side, we uh, look a lot at international development aid for media. And unlike philanthropic giving, uh, international development aid is stable for last around 15, 20 years at a half a billion, 500 million per year. However, donors are aware of the need that's growing and want to do more and are looking more and more at ways to collaborate and contribute not only to grant giving, but also to the impact in investing sector. So I look forward to this conversation and uh, also our breakout groups later. Um, thank you again, and um, I hope you will enjoy the session. Super. Thank you so much, Mira. And now over to our wonderful moderator, Anya. Can um, people hear me? Is the mic working? Yeah, great. If not, I can bellow because I teach. So I'm used to bellowing in Columbia rooms. Um, I'm Anya Schifrin, and I'm at the School of International and Public Affairs, where I run our technology, media, and communication specialization. Um, and uh, I was going to ask all the panelists to introduce themselves before I kick off the discussion. Everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Duck Wu, and I'm the Director for Journalism and Sustainability at Knight Foundation. I'm Tracy Powell, and I'm the founder of the Pivot Fund. Um, previously, I was on the fundraiser for the Racial Justice and Balance Alliance. I'm Sharon Moshavi. I'm the president of ICFJ, the International Center for Journalists. My name is Asha Wajic. I'm a co founder of the investment firm with Investing Media and Technology with the Board Center. The name of your hand is. Yeah. Um, apologies, folks. Uh, if we could use the microphones so that the live stream can can hear us. Okay, that's fine. Um, we do have these microphones. Just just pass them along the lines, and then people speak. Thank you. Hi, I'm Harlan Mandel. I'm the CEO of Media Development Investment Fund. I'm Carlos Barrio Nuevo. Um, I'm a director at Public Media Company. Uh, we work with public media companies across the country. Hi, I'm Janna Krawczyk from Poland. I I am the head of partnerships at uh, Gazda Wyborcza, the biggest uh, national daily, legacy daily, but also I am here in my capacity as the president of uh, Gazda Wyborcza Foundation. Good morning. Uh, my name is Zoe Titus. I'm wearing two hats today. I'm the director of the Namibia Media Trust uh, based in Ventuk, Namibia, and also the chairperson of the Global Forum for Media Development. I'm Branko Brikic, editor of Daily Maverick, South Africa. Right. Does this is this working? I don't think it is. Um, oh, Renan, so I'll go into bellow it. teaching mode, or I, I think we need it for the live stream. So if you wouldn't mind, sure. Using my... Me too. Great. Um, is this working? Yeah. Terrific. Good. Well, of course, I uh, want to add my voice to those of us at Columbia who are welcoming you here today. It's really incredible to see you all here. Um, we been we haven't had enough visitors over the last few years, and walking into the room yesterday and seeing so many many old friends, and I'm sure people that will be new friends was just really, really inspiring. So it's just great to have you on campus. Um, as I'm sure you know, President Bollinger is a very keen First Amendment supporter and scholar, and Columbia has done a lot to support free expression, and we have a bunch of centers on campus. So you're really in the right university, and it, it's just terrific. Um, this topic is such a perennial. Uh, many of us have been working together for 10, 15, 20 years, and it's a subject that always comes up. Um, so I thought it would be fun today to focus a little bit on what's new, what's changed, and what's working. Um, with my students and I, we did a couple reports for the Conrad Adenauer Foundation that we published in 21 and 22 during the pandemic that sort of mapped out what we'd seen in terms of philanthropy and government support during the pandemic. And I definitely felt that things had changed. There were absolutely new trends in funding. And I thought it'd be great to 
to maybe start with the donors in the room to find out how have you changed what you do since COVID? Has it caused you to rethink your strategies? Hi, uh, Duck Lou again here. And uh, I will admit, I don't know the answer to that since I just started earlier this year after COVID is hopefully in the rear, rear view mirror. Uh, but what I will say in terms of how we're approaching it now is that uh, I am the first person at Knight Foundation with uh, the word sustainability in his or her job title, uh, which I think is a really important uh, objective for journalism to achieve right now. I know we've been talking about sustainability, but that's really how we evaluate weight and judge uh, the grant proposals that we have coming in is that ultimately what we're hoping to see is that the proposals that are coming in front of Knight Foundation are ultimately going to be ones that Knight Foundation is not involved in after the after the term of the grant. Uh, and, and for us, that, that that means that they end up being able to find and seek uh, the allies and the other folks uh, in their communities that are able to support those organizations um, so that Knight is able to focus on other areas that are going to need help in the future as well. Hmm. I wonder if that's realistic. That's a great question. And uh, I'll let you know in a couple of years if it is. <laughs> what about the sort of track record? I mean, do you have a lot of outlets that you funded that did become independent or self-sufficient afterwards? Well, first, I, or I, do you mean maybe partly like how would you define sustainable maybe is better question? Sure. So I think about sustainability at two different levels. Uh, one is at the individual newsroom level where we are one trying to help newsrooms experiment with new revenue ideas. We're trying to help them diversify their revenue models. We're trying to help them lower the costs associated with um, starting, sustaining, and growing their newsrooms. And then sustainability for me at the ecosystem level um, is about how can we help catalyze new funders, uh, new talent pipelines, uh, new resources to come in and support the broader journals of ecosystem in the way that it isn't already. And on the flip side of that is thinking about sustainability when it comes to how might we reallocate resources that are at this point underutilized, inefficient, whatever whatever you uh, whatever the case may be, and reallocate them so that they are better serving the needs of journalism right now. Directly answering your question about whether or not the newsrooms themselves end up being sustainable is that even though sustainability is in my title, I think the real objective that we're trying to achieve is informed and engaged communities. That's really what the answer is when it comes to what we're trying to do at night. And so potentially media and independent journalism is one of the keys to that, but it's necessary, but it's not necessarily the what has to happen in order for a community to be informed and engaged. And so that that's part of it as well as like we're, we're constantly experimenting to figure out what are the uh, what is necessary for that objective to be achieved. And so uh, I can't name any of the um, organizations right now that are like completely sustainable, but it's about what does it take for the communities to be informed and engaged? And that's really the outcome that we're trying to achieve for. Can you just give an example of inefficiency? Because I always think of, you know, I was nine years on the OSF journalism board, and um, I always thought of our grantees as total shoestring, incredibly hardworking, you know, get if volunteers, cheap office space where they could get it, like really, you know, I, I didn't see a lot of, what do you mean by inefficiency? Yeah. Uh, my first grant uh, that we gave uh, was with, uh, I think, a resource uh, that I think is underutilized right now and uh, very, very relevant to Columbia University. It's college students. Um, I think that would be an inefficient resource right now that we could think about in terms of how might college students uh, be better reoriented to serve the needs of local journalism in a way that it's not. So uh, one of my first grants that I gave was to the University of Vermont uh, and a professor there, uh, and at the University of Vermont, what they have is a program where rather when they wanted to create and, and create a program for students to engage in journalism, rather than create their own student newsroom, Instead, what they did was they said, how might we get an editor, have that person then collaborate and coordinate with the independent news outlets across the state of Vermont, and then send the students out into those actual newsrooms to get real world hands on practice, uh, and then work with the editor to then be able to actually write the stories, go to the city council meetings, go to those places where they couldn't get uh, reporters to go in themselves. 
and be better able to then actually, you know, fill those community information gaps where they existed because the community outlets weren't ready to do it themselves. I love projects like that. Does it lead, do you have something where you fund people to go then work in journalism afterwards, or do you have, um, do you know how often they get jobs in journalism afterwards? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, with that program, it just started, so I don't have that yet. I think what we're doing there is that some of the things I really liked about the program was that one, it got students who were not journalism majors interested in writing for and becoming really interested in civic government in a way. So, so just, just you know, the three wins there is that uh, one, students got to get their uh, bylines in places that their parents and their friends read. Uh, two, uh, the community outlets obviously got great coverage uh, and free things that they couldn't otherwise get themselves. And the University of Vermont got a program uh, where they were able to, you know, create a great program for these students to enjoy. So it's it's just it's just a redirection because we also get quite often universities who come to us and say, we want our own student newsroom. And my question is, what is that purpose going to serve? And thinking about, is that a resource that might be better allocated in a different way? Really interesting. Tracy, what about you? What are you up to that's new since COVID or anything um, else? Well, the Pivot Fund is new. Mm -hmm. uh, we officially launched in January. Um, and I think um, what is not really different, when I was at Ridge, the Ridge Fund, when I launched that, I immediately knew that just capital investments weren't enough. We had to layer that with capacity building and technical support. And so with the Pivot Fund, that's exactly how we started out. We started out by delivering some capacity building services, um, consulting services, helping folks write job descriptions and do recruiting and hiring, um, connecting them with fundraising consultants, membership consultants, um, working with the Center for um, Cooperative Media and doing some infrastructure building around collaborations. And so you know, that's how the Pivot Fund started out. You cannot um, get to sustainability if you don't have capacity. And so that's why that's our focus. You also can't get to sustain sustainability if you're not already engaged with and in or embedded in the communities that you serve because you can't build sustainability without a foundation. Um, the trust and relationships with communities is the foundation. So the Pivot Fund centers communities um, so that we are already investing in organizations that have um, proof of product, if you will. They already have track records with the audiences that they serve. Um, and then we go from there and help um, provide, provide them with capital and support so that they can increase sustainability, but also increase their influence in their communities. So those two things are really key and important in what we're embarking on. Can you tell us a bit about which communities and which outlets? Yes. So the, the, the Pivot Fund focuses on underserved communities. We invest at the intersection of race, ethnicity, income, um, gender identity. So several, several of the what some people would call marginalized communities, um, because we understand that those are the communities that are growing. There's a browning of America that's happening right now. And yet a lot of news organizations have not invested resources, have not covered those communities fairly and respectfully, have not provided critical news and information um, to those communities. So the organizations we look to are the ones who are already embedded in those communities and they understand what the, the information needs of those communities and they're about the business of serving those information needs. Which cities, which outlets? So we, we launched in Georgia, mm -hmm. but we have our eyes on several organizations across this country. One of the things that we found is these organizations are unicorns, but they're not unicorns. They exist all over. You have people who have social media, media based news outlets they are in the, if you will, the lion's den of where disinformation is most prevalent, and they're fighting against it. They just don't, they're just fighting with their with their hands tied behind their backs because they don't have the resources and the capital to, to grow their influence and, and to fight it on a on a level playing field. And so the Pivot Fund comes in and we try to level that playing field a little bit for them. Um, you know, I think that, you know, there's an example of one of the organizations we uh, currently fund is BTV. It started out on social media. It was a, a woman journalist who could not get an on-camera journalism job to save her life. 
And so I won't go into the whole story, but she started posting news and information on her, on her Facebook page. And that community grew to the thousands and thousands. And not only serving her primarily black audience, but you know, she's in a town that is divided by a railroad track, black from white. And so white folks started following her too. Um, and we see how that resource has now lifted the entire information system in her rural Georgia town. That's the kind of stuff that we need to be looking for. We're, we talk so much about news deserts. There are oases in these news deserts that if we look a little more closely, we will find them. Now she owns a TV station that goes into 600,000 homes in the Spectrum Cable Network. Why in the heck are we not supporting that kind of work? And I think that, you know, you know, again, the example that she that she has, that she is, I mean, this there was a horrible, horrible tragedy in her community recently. And, you know, three young men were killed, two white, one black. The local newspaper that is capsizing decided to cover the story, but they only covered the lives of the two white men who were killed. They completely erased the young black man's life. BTV came in and covered this story the way it should have been covered in the first place. And that brought the community together. It showed them what they had in common rather than perpetuating divisions. And so when the pivot fund goes out to vet news organizations that we invest in, that's what we look for. We're not investing in superstar journalists. We're investing in the people who are providing the information that their communities need, healing the visions, and trying to equip and inform communities so that they can better, better navigate their lives. It's really inspiring. And I was wondering, what kind of engagement um, do you look for? Duke mentioned engagement. What what do you see? And are people, do people, I mean, I always worry about uh, like membership models, because I was worried that people are busy. I mean, do people have time to come out? What what would you like? What's your, yeah, what are you inspired by? Yeah, so the organizations, again, that we invest in already kind of have a track record of they are having impact in their communities. They are in fully engaged. They are embedded in their communities. So we look at not necessarily traffic, because we want to see, I mean, people can, you know, you can like a Facebook page or click on a story up but if they're engaging if they're talking to that member that founder or the reporter at that organization and then what kind of information are they getting back and more importantly once they get the information what do they do with it so those are the kinds of things that we look for um, there are a couple of organizations that we invest in who are hosting events so around um, getting to know you know you know city government uh, or or candidates or mayoral candidates. Um, one recently hosted a, a, a meet and greet, but a more actually a discussion with Stacey Abrams, who's running for governor in Georgia. So looking at the attendance at that, those events, the participation, but even I think one of the things that, I'm, that the Pivot Fund is doing now is we are able to invest more creatively, if you will. So for example, in Columbus, Georgia, where the newspaper I, I used to work at, um, I think might have two or three journalists covering all of Columbus and the region around it. Um, we are now investing um, in a collaboration between the largest black owned radio network in the state. They have six stations in Columbus alone. And we're, we're supporting the collaboration between those six stations and the local, um, a local black newspaper. It used to be a print product before the pandemic. Now it is not. They cease printing during the pandemic. There is all digital, but they're producing critical news and information. They're reaching an audience that, you know, the dwindling local newspaper there can't can't hasn't reached. Not even when I worked there, they, they weren't reaching them. And I, th I think this is what we have to do as funders, as journalists, as we got to think outside of the box about reaching people where they are. With news, with news and information. Tracy, this is fascinating. I will say that in the interviews I did for the reports that I wrote, a lot of funders said to me that Black Lives Matter was a total wake up call and made them think about how they were grant making in the U.S. and the importance not just of local news, but underserved communities. I think, you know, I was trying to explain to a non-journalist uh, in my department, in my program yesterday, and I thought about it this morning. I thought we're really on wartime footing here in the U.S. You know, many of you have come from overseas. Obviously, you were all horrified by the election of Donald Trump. 
but I think that for all of us who are in this country, it's a, you know, it's a really terrifying moment. And that has just absolutely galvanized everybody and to some extent changed how, how we go about our business, I think. So Tracy, super inspiring. Yeah, please. Oh, th- no, thank you so much for saying that. I think when it comes to communities of color in particular, mm. they are being bombarded with disinformation. Um, They are highly targeted. And so it's important to invest in people and journalists and news outlets that are already engaged with their communities and already um, facilitators of of conversation. I was listening to in the earlier earlier session about WhatsApp. So one of the organizations that I invested in um, when I was with Ridge, the Racial Equity and Journalism Fund, is Documented, which is based here in New York, and they cover um, using information for immigrants. Um, we recognized really early on that WhatsApp was a really problematic place. And so how do we interrupt or disrupt the flow of disinformation on WhatsApp? Um, Documented did a superior job, but more importantly, they served as a a peer educator, if you will. And so that other Spanish language news outlets in Lossie, North Carolina, for example, was able to adapt the same strategy to disrupt disinformation on WhatsApp based on the work that documented did. Now, I know that is being duplicated and replicated in other places. We were able to do that because we invested significant dollars in documented dollars that allowed them to sustain, but also grow their influence. And yes, the election of Donald Trump was a wake up call for some, but not communities of color. I think that um, the death or the murder of George Floyd was also a wake up call for funders to, to invest more dollars in um, racial equity and, and news and journalism. Um, unfortunately, we're seeing funders roll back those promises. And we're also seeing them be, think that they can reach those communities by investing in organizations that are really quite distanced from communities. Um, they're not folks who are um, embedded in communities and really understand and have those trusted relationships. So we're seeing a rollback and, and that's one of the things that the Pivot Fund hopes to help change the tide on. Tracy, thank you so much. I'll just add that my st- I had a student two years ago who's who's Lao American and her grandmother. I mean, the amount they live in Rhode Island and the amount of disinformation around elections targeted the elderly Laotian community was something that never would have occurred to me. And it was a real problem. And she was having to, you know, help the elders in her community. Thank you very much, Tracy. Sharon, what about you? What's new? I think, talk. I think of you as more global rather than <laughs> yes. U.S. What, what have you done new? since the pandemic um you know i think the pandemic for what we what we saw and continue to see required i think a couple of pivots or or diving in deeper into areas where we were first is to your point about investing in people and and journalists it's it's the pipeline and i think on a sustainability side you see journalists small and meet who have started small and medium news organizations the business part is the afterthought it's the thing they don't want to do and you can capacity train them etc which is absolutely key but really changing a mindset and that means starting at the beginning of the pipeline when people have their ideas for projects things they want to go do it is always the oh i have this great editorial plan and i'll say well do you have a business plan oh i'll think about that later um and that in, and even It can be an established news organization that's been around for a few years, doing a great job covering their communities. There is a reluctance really to understand that this is, we all talk about this is a great existential crisis, but that deep passion, I guess is the word, um, passion for understanding an Excel spreadsheet for how many new products do I need? Do I need a salesperson? What is my, what is diversifying revenue mean besides writing out a bunch of grant applications? It is a real, real struggle. And, and because of COVID, you're seeing a lot more people, you know, a lot of people have gone out on their own. A lot of people want to change up their lives. Um, a lot of, there is a, I think the passion for the work has increased, uh, and the need to do things differently, but I don't think people really have the tools and investing in the pipelines and the and the capacity building is something that I think is really important. And a corollary to that, I will say is mental health, I'll just sort of bring that into, which is a piece of the sustainability. And that struck me a lot 
uh, in the conversation, if you all heard it last night about journalism under attack and you had, you know, Sally Busby and, you know, people from top organizations saying basically my, my staff is getting burned out. Um, and I, and I, I think that is something we absolutely have to put, look at hand in hand with sustainability. Are you giving everybody the tools to keep going, to stay in journalism? Who is leaving? Who is just basically just kind of walking away? Are we attracting the right talent to the field, both on the the journalism side and on the business side? I think that is a crucial, crucial thing that we have to sort of look at. We tend to sort of look at these things in silos. Here's disinformation, here's sustainability, here's trust. And they're very integrated. And I think any capacity building that we do in terms of getting news organizations to become and to work towards financial uh, financial sustainability has to look at those things in tandem. So you can't just sort of sort of disaggregate these things, I think. And that's, I think, has come home for us a lot post-COVID. What would be a tool that would help people not burning out when every so many journalists are really- This is the grout. If I had the answer, I, you know, I'd be on my yacht. Um, I don't- <laughs> um, I, do, I think part of it, frankly, the part that we're sort of trying to do what we can is getting people out of their silos. Again, COVID, we all got isolated. Reporting became something and working. You, you're sitting in front of your computer, not going out into the community as much, not seeing coworkers. And I think one of the things that we're finding is the value of peer-to-peer -peer interaction and networking. Um, because people are learning from each other. You're not in it alone. Um, there is a lot of value in... Um, in 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 have in being heard and in getting other ideas, um, you know. Example is the online attacks, um, and I loved Sally's call yesterday for sort of you know a conversation about best practices. Here's a, you know a small you know feeling that you can talk you can talk about these things with others who've had the same experience. Are you starting an organization, and what business models have you found that work? What what auxiliary services have you started that maybe I could learn from? Getting that, I think, does energize people in an ability. And again, I think post-COVID, we've been so siloed that those kinds of networking and peer-to-peer -peer sharing have been, people are really hungry for that. Yeah, when we were doing our studies, um, publishing for peanuts and fighting for survival, we found it was amazing how many um, media, how many journalists around the world had gotten ideas from conferences. It actually really converted me. Plus, since I go to conferences like this, as well as academic ones, I can say this kind are people are way more entertaining. <laughs> we'll always come back super inspired and excited. In um, Many of you know I edited African Muckraking and Global Muckraking, which goes back 200 years, investigative reporting from the Global South. And I found a lot of those folks lasted about 10 years and then gave up, usually. Didn't mean it was lost, but you know, you, I always thought we had to build the New York Times. It was really important to have long lasting. But a lot of the journalists who had the most impact in the 19th century, you know, published a pamphlet for a few years change something and then and then stopped yeah um, and so if you invest in people i mean you know exactly. you know silicon valley's done a great job investing in serial entrepreneurs and maybe your first news outlet is going to fail but your second one or your third or whatever you do and getting that i think investing in those people i feel like musakila mujid i don't know if he's in the room it's a great example right he's been working at different outlets over decades and training the next generation too yeah Fantastic. Uh, one thing I want to add to one of the projects we're running is an excel is an accelerator for small and medium medium newsrooms, and it's mm -hmm. global. And what I found really interesting again is how many and we we decided to experiment. Are people you know is somebody in you know Fiji going to get out of what somebody's doing in Brazil? And it's been really interesting because. There is this sense of oh, it's not just me in my own in my own universe who is dealing with these problems. Um, there's a lot to be learned, and what we've discovered too is if you're if you're learning and sharing experiences with people, completely not a competitor. You know, you, you know, you can be not, but completely out of your wheelhouse. Um, people open up. There's a lot more. Um, Honesty, shall we say? Uh, of course, say sure, please. No, 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 um, no, go for it. So on this issue of burnout, I was not here last night because I was on the phone with a journalist mm -hmm. who was, who's quite frankly burning out. And she was asking me how can she stick with doing what she's doing? One thing I would suggest is that funders consider providing dollars to help give them a break. And this is something me and my friends at the National Women's Media Foundation, we're trying to strategize around. How do we give funding to folks to hire their temporary replacement, 
right? To give them a break, let them go do some professional development, let them go get some therapy um, or take a vacation. That's really, really important, especially when you're a two or three person operation. But here's the other thing, you have to give them money to hire capacity so they are not trying to juggle all the balls and keep all the balls in the air. Again, we, you know, we, we think that these folks who are one or two, three people operations can do it all, and that is unsustainable. They cannot. And so if we give them the capacity, give them the support and the resources they need so that they don't have to do all the things so that they can focus on the newsroom or just focus on the operational side instead of trying to do both, I think is really, really critical for their success and sustainability. Thank you. Um, Gerald, would you like to come in here? Yeah. Sure. Tell us anything. You I am Gerald from uh, the Ford Foundation. And at Ford, I don't, you know, I don't really think we've changed anything since the pandemic. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, the way we think about investing in journalism is really investing in media as a whole and thinking about the power of storytelling in various forms to really shape the perceptions of society, our values our systems of belief, and deepen our understanding of the world. And when we look at who's shaping that and the gatekeepers, there's a real unfairness to it in terms of who's the gatekeepers and therefore which stories are valued and which stories get out there. Um, and then the other thing we're thinking about is what are the ways to reach people where they are and what forms really resonate? Because when we think about the burnout and people addressing, you know, it's like, maybe we'll write in print. Maybe some people only watch TikTok videos. I don't know. But it's really thinking about how do you reach people and what are the most powerful ways of shaping that in a world where at the current moment, you know, maybe 10% of media funding goes to minority communities and women are significantly underrepresented in, in those newsrooms, in any place where stories are being told. Um, so we have really been investing in who are creating more space in the storytelling that can really help expand whose stories are told and which voices are represented and hopefully lead to more accurate, as you pointed out, the story is often not fully accurate and more inclusivity in the world. So um, long history, both on the investment side and, and programmatic side. Um, things we're currently exploring, uh, we have a deep interest in impact investing on the team that I sit on. So we've been looking at how to support more content on impact investing. This is in a scene where there's a lot of backlash recently on ESG and really trying to think about anything other than um, shareholder maximizing value for shareholders and not the workers, not anyone else. So there's strong pushback on that recently in the media. And then we have been thinking of how to reach other people to understand the importance of, you know, aligning with how you think and where you spend your capital. So exploring kind of video game work, right? And so we're really trying to be creative in how we think about this and how we think about um, what shapes perspectives. Uh, some things we've invested in have worked, others have not worked at all. Um, but, you know, there are different lessons we can take from that. And we're, we're really experimenting with everything from, you know, in one, we invested in a fund to allow them to produce a lot of different documentaries or stories. In another, we invested in the company. Um, and one of the things we're finding is also the distribution matters. So, when you think about putting an idea out there, putting a script, writing your article, it's very difficult to then think through what's the next step in getting that message out there to an audience, and then the different controls that will happen there, and how, as you do that, you may lose control of the narrative with different edits and so on. So we've been thinking about that too. Don't have a lot of answers, a lot of questions, but we continue to think about that. Gerald, can you tell us um, more specifically, like what countries or what cities? Oh, yeah. Or so it's global. Grantees, maybe it's mm -hmm. global. Um, and some of the ones we've looked at, you know, a long time ago, we did independent press. Um, we also invested in open democracy, which was an online platform. Yep. 
Um, and then in terms of, you know, other types of content, one community fund does documentaries. So we, we supported them macro, you know, does creative movies and tries to bring new stories. And so it would be anything from, um, was the one sorry to bother you was a macro film and then i think they did judas and the black messiah and so we are really thinking about you know how do you reach people where they are how can you disarm people in terms of getting them to think differently about the narrative because some of the burnout comes from we've tried to reach people the same way we're like let me write you this long prose because that's the way i process things and this will appeal to you or let me debate you and and that isn't working but when it's interesting when people watch certain things they're like hey i didn't know did you see so we've been trying a lot of those and so those are some of them and then you know in the publications uh la notica in, in north carolina spanish language paper there's mlk 50 which um did the um, research with propublica on the hospitals um, so there are a few there, you know, and there's more, there's in the further back, those Sahara mm -hmm. reporters, which is, you know, African. Our Nigeria. former student who's been in and out of jail in Nigeria. Yes. So we've all been signing <laughs> petitions for him. Yes. Yeah. So, so a lot um, covers a large area. Dick, look, did you want to come in, Dick? Or you take mine? Uh, That's close, sir. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, I just wanted to tie uh, some of the threads that we've been coming across with the pandemic and and COVID and um, burnout and also conferences. Let me let me let me, uh, let, me let me just try to tie it together in terms of how I'm thinking about it. Is that um, it? Just really feels in terms of what leads to burnout is that there's been I want to guess maybe nearly like a 25 year bear market in journalism and the expectations that people have for journalism ever since the dot-com bust to the great financial crisis um, to the rise of the social media companies eating everyone's lunches to the pandemic itself. Each one of them has marked a lower low when it comes to like people's expectations for a career in journalism as well as for the organizations that, that come out on the other side of it. And I would wager that two things. One, in an environment like that, where literally a generation has grown up with people telling them that this industry is dying and that you can't make a career in it, of course, the people who are still in it are going to feel burnout, right? Because there's like, who's the next who's the next person that's going to come in and help and create the impact and serve the communities that I'm in right now? Um, I think the mic stopped working. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Sorry about that. And so let, let me just tie that into uh, the one place where I see there is a bull market and growth is in journalism conferences. I, I would, here's the tie in. Um, I would wager that I'm amongst probably the top 5% in the world right now are traveling over the past six months, uh, going to journalism conferences. Uh, I mean, like just, just in, in, in I, uh, just over the past couple of months, I was at the uh, Asian American Journalism Conference, the uh, NABJ and NAHJ. I was at the Native American Journalism Conference. And I will tell you that one thing that united them, other than being a lot of fun, was record attendance. Each one of them, I think, had more people there than they had ever had in the history of their organizations, which to me says that if this is not the inflection point for journalism turning around, I really don't know what is. It's it's just the, the, the record attendance is inspiring to me because it tells me that those folks are seeing that there's something they want. They want the community. They want to come together. They want to figure out what's next for journalism. And the people that are already in the industry are going to be the allies that they need to take it forward. Um, and so just tying it all back into my bias here is that part of my answer about what 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 helps burnout like what's going to alleviate some of the problems and causes of burnout is i think sustainability right like it's going to be growth the way to address burnout is to give people the resources that they need in order to do their jobs well to have the impact that they want to have to have colleagues that they want to associate with to be able to go out into the field and see what they're doing and so sustainability is the answer and, and i'm hoping that with 
uh, what's happening and, and, and seeing just the the new blooms of uh, and, and the thousand seeds that are being planted as people go out and and with clear eyes about what's happening in journalism and deciding they want to be in the industry, stay in the industry, grow in the industry, uh, it, it's hopefully going to be the cause that leads to the sustainability that we need. Great. Before I pass, I just want to say that um, I got I spent three weeks in Australia in July, and the news media bargaining code has forced Google and Meta to spend money on journalism. It's been a hundred. It's two hundred million Australian a year, and they're hiring like crazy. Every single journalism professor I spoke to, all their students are getting jobs. So one thing that's changed for me in the pandemic is that we need structural, large scale solutions, and not just look at isolated communities. Um, later, I'll tell you about the conference we're having on that topic on a, in October 21, in case anybody feels like they want another conference. But uh, Gerard, let me hand you the mic. And I'll just, and then we'll go to I'll just add one quick thing, which is, you know, often in when I'm at conferences like this, I think we always think of journalism in the sense of really cutting the hard news, someone doing breaking news, Sahara reporters, corruption in Nigeria, different things, the political climate. What I will say has been interesting when I ask people, hey, why have you signed up for that New York Times or XYZ subscription? What has been interesting is, we'll think what that means for us. What has been interesting has been some of the things like, hey, I really like the cooking thing that they had. And I really like the games and I play Wordle every day. And I, you know, it's interesting because, well, it isn't why we would say, oh yeah, that sounds great. That's why you signed up. It is interesting to think of what that has done in terms of the sustainability of the organization and the importance of thinking of what are the types of stories or things people want to hear about, because even the people reading the newspapers do have some sort of burnout from, hey, this is, you know, this is negative, this is more negative, slightly less negative. Pull in and and people get excited about reading or trying to do each day that brings them to those sites and makes these organizations fully sustainable. So that's. So, you know what I've just realized is we have 45 minutes left. And so I think I've been talking too much and the audience will want to ask questions. So I'm going to shut up. You, you were all given the question, which is something like how can editorial, how can funding be compatible with editorial independence? If you want to answer that, you can, but if you want to just continue talking about interesting new things that you're doing, that's fine too. So over to you, Sasha. Thank you. Thank you. So I think I will come from a slightly different angle into this story. And I think just for the context, I think we have two parallel topics over here going on. There's one is the situation in the US and all this inspiring work that is done in the US. There's totally different international story. And I am from this international part. And just to explain how different it is, uh, we've just heard, and I trust that, that you know, it's it, journalism in U.S. is going down and down and down. It doesn't seem to be you know, hitting the bottom point. Actually, in the rest of the world, I think in most of the world, journalism is booming. You know, you go to Asia the last seven years, it's the best time to start a media company. You know, there's this transition in technology from one kind to the other and to ownership structures from one to the other. And there are startups coming everywhere. There's no issue of, there's actually the problem with employment because they can't find enough talent. So that is how different that thing is. So the other disclaimer I wanna say is now I work for the company that does not define itself either as a for-profit or non-for-profit. We believe that every investment in any media company that provides information in forums communities is an impact investment, if there is a, such a thing as impact investment. So as long as the company group of people or individual is sending some information that serves somebody to be better informed, that's an impact investment. And uh, I spent 17 years in, the, in that space. You know, I was one of the founders of what at that time was Media Development Loan Fund, which is now NDIF. And, but I'm saying that because I, I, I have experience of both sides. And that is what I want to talk about. I have experience in how does it look like on the nonprofit side with nonprofit investors. And I know how does it look looks like on the other side of, with for-profit investors. And I am happy to report that basically 
international support for independent journalism and investment in independent journalism outside of US is ready for retirement. It does not work. It's inefficient. It's, I believe, wrongly targeted, and it does not have effect that you would want. Um, I can now go into, you know, very quickly, you know, why, because it comes too late. You know, it lasts too short. Donors jump from one flavor of the year to another flavor of the year. Donors never stay long enough. Uh, and I can give million examples of different countries. Um, and I actually think that there is no, coming back to, to the question that we were asked, you know, is there a way that you can structure investment in a media company and protect independent uh, uh, independent editorial policy? The answer is actually incredibly simple. There is no way to do that. Everything else, saying anything else is just an illusion. Um, you can be a for-profit company, and then you will get the board of directors and the owner. You can be a non-profit, you will get set a board of directors who will tell you what is the ideology behind it. You can be a trust, and then you will get a piece of paper that has to be in place next 150 years. And if you are lucky like Scott Trust, then it's going to work, but most of them do not work. So... There are different ways how we can fix that. But the key issue is, and my key point is this, the only way to protect independent editorial policy of any company is to protect the ownership of that company. There is no other sustainability. They, they, there's no sustainable newsroom if the company is not sustainable. There's no way, you know, and, and if you if you want to take that one step further, I would say, the, the way that we can see how, uh, how bright the future of independent media is, is directly proportional to the amount of money that we can raise to make investments in independent media outside of US. So it's basically as simple as that. No. I was gonna it's say okay. that leads very well to Harlan, but I So I, I always hate following Sasha. <laughs> I always feel incredibly shallow. Um, but um, uh, just picking up a little bit on the impact of the pandemic, and it kind of dovetails with what, what Sasha was saying about what's happening in the rest of the world. Um, you know, we were expecting our clients, companies that we're you know, uh, financing, um, to uh, have a very hard time from the pandemic, because right? all the predictions were it was going to destroy the media economy and advertising. But what actually happened for many companies in many parts of the world is it really kickstarted uh, the movement towards um, audience driven revenue models, right? Um, Rocco, I'm sure, will be talking about that as one of the great success stories. Um, um, but, you know, you know, in, in, Many, many of our clients really expanded their subscriptions and membership models during this period. Um, <clears throat> the other thing I think that um, when I think of the impact of the period of the pandemic, it's hard to separate it from the impact of Trump. Um, and obviously, for those of us, for those of us in the U.S., it has had a major impact, but we shouldn't ester underestimate the impact it has had on the rest of the world. Um, I remember the day after the election, I saw my uh, colleague from South Africa, Mohammed Nanabe, and he put his arms around me and said, welcome to our world. You know, what we're experiencing is really not much compared to what so many other parts of the world have been experiencing for much longer. Um, and that goes directly to this question, I think, of how do you protect uh, uh, independence of um, a media company's editorial line. Um, and um, uh, Anya asked me to talk about one thing that we're doing, which is related to that. And this goes to the question of media capture, you know, which is something that's uh, been around forever and it's a global phenomenon. Um, uh, I think uh, Sasha led the way in thinking about ways of combating that, you know, through ownership. Um, and um, 
in you know recent years, um, it's taken, I guess, a specifically virulent form in Europe, um, in Central Europe and outside of Central Europe and Eastern Europe, um, uh, with uh, I guess um, the Orban regime in Hungary being the the worst case, where almost the entire media sector has been taken over by um, uh, enrolled into one trust controlled by the government, um, something like 95% of the media. Um, so um, we had uh, an opportunity in, in a number of cases to try to intervene. And I think exactly as Sasha said, the only way to counter media capture is by uh, uh, taking an ownership position, either by strengthening the ownership that is uh, uh, committed to an independent editorial line or intervening um, uh, and in a way competing for the ownership of a company uh, against a uh, uh, state controlled buyer. Um, so um, based on some successes that we had, we decided we wanted to try to create a, a vehicle specifically designed for combating media capture in Europe. Um, and that was launched in December. It's called Pluralis. And um, uh, I think it's an interesting model. Uh, and it, it's very much in a way driven by the impact investing conversation, you know, and using uh, investment models from the impact investing world, if there is such a thing. But um, the, the, so, um, the goal of the fund is to be you know, ready to intervene when a company is under threat of capture, um, or in some cases where there's already a company that has been captured to try to reverse that. Um, and uh, what, what's unique about the fund is its structure and its ownership. So it's structured as a holding company, so it's an evergreen model, meaning that instead of a, where a typical investment fund, you would need to, um, aim to exit a company within a certain number of years. Here, there's no pressure to exit unless it's mission aligned exit. Um, uh, it's a blended capital model. So it, it combines, um, and I think this is part of what's very powerful. It's a combination of philanthropy, um, high quality West European media companies, um, and impact investors um, coming together and they, you know, they all have different strengths. So having the media companies involved brings you know, tremendous access to know-how and knowledge transfer. Um, uh, having philanthropy involved, they're able to provide a layer of what's called risk mitigation. So they can take on more risk and reduce the risk for more commercial investors. Um, and, um, and those commercial investors help provide the scale that's needed to do something like this, because in Europe, you need a certain amount of scale to be able to have an impact. Um, so the fund has uh, made its first two investments, one um, in a company in Slovakia, where uh, a um, somewhat criminal hedge fund, I guess is a good way of putting it, had was able to get into the ownership. So we were able to take them out. Um, and then in Poland, uh, uh, a company called Grammy Media, which is the, I guess, the number two uh, leading uh, daily paper, or publishes the number two leading daily paper, Respospolita, okay. which is, I guess, the leading economic daily, was um, on the verge of being taken over by the state of yeah, uh, energy company. I, I, don't, I don't know yet. Um, and we were able to intervene and, and take an ownership position to prevent that. Um, to date, we've raised about 40 million euros for the fund. We're hoping to get it to 100 million. And again, in Europe, to be able to take these positions, um, you need a certain amount of scale. Um, and again, I want to give Sasha credit for the first time. I've seen this done was with uh, Nobilist in Croatia um, under Sasha's leadership. And you know, we, are, we continue to be inspired by the original OG. Check one, two, three, test one, two, three. Does this work out for you? Let's use that mic instead. I think we're having a little trouble with this. Mic trouble? This one. Yeah. Okay. Get the audio so, levels up a bit. Thank you. Hello. Yes. Yeah. 
Whistle. Definitely. And I, I have to say, I'm Elizabeth Hanson Shapiro. I apologize for being late. I'm the CEO and co founder of the National Trust for Local News. And um, it's such an honor to go after Sasha and Harlan. Sasha was instrumental in our first acquisition in Colorado and really the, the inspiration uh, to me in the structure that we set up there. And uh, the National Trust for Local News hopes, hopes to uh, grow up to be uh, some version of the MDIF here in, in the state. So, really great to um, be up here with the two of you. So yeah, part of our um, part of our impact thesis for um, media in the US is that ownership structures are really the intervention point for sustainability and also frankly for media capture. So one of the things that keeps no, me up at night is that um, you know media capture is on the shores of of the US, like it's here and it's growing. And I don't think we have the tools to combat it. Um, we certainly have great examples and learning, um, but part of what we are trying to do in states around the country is pilot a conservancy model for acquiring small legacy titles, converting them to nonprofits where that makes sense or other mission aligned structures and really treating them as the public assets that they are and protecting those from both financial capture um, as we've seen plenty of in the US um, and also political capture. So I'm happy to talk more in the questions about some of the models that we're experimenting with, but um, I think it's a really key moment in the US. You know, one of the ways that COVID has changed the very small local news landscape, we've just seen the acceleration of closures of small legacy news titles across the country. And, you know, you can think of like the Dallas Morning News or the Boston Globe, like this is a much different scale. These are newsrooms that are in some instances hundreds of years old that have been inside family, uh, you know, family businesses, most of them um, for a long time and are now, you know, still hanging on serving communities in some cases of, you know, counties of 10,000 people. So in a lot of places, when these, uh, when these newsrooms, when these owners decide to hang it up, um, it's lights out and they're the kind of news deserts where, you know, there's not philanthropy to have a startup. No big metro newsroom is, I think, ever going to see their way to placing a reporter in these places. So it's really, I think, like the front line of small D democracy to protect these tiny newsrooms. So that's what we're trying to do. Um, and happy to talk more about it and happy to be here. Great. Thank you. <laughs> so... Um... Yeah, let me let me keep this focus on ownership and and some other things. So I, I'm with Public Media Company, um, which has been which was created a long time ago um, in another era when um, public media was looking at seeing signals go away when FM radio was happening, and they were looking. They were uh, created because there was a crisis then of ownership. Um, six signals were going to uh, Christian broadcasters and not to public media. And so that was one of those many crises. Uh, and it, what's happened now is what we're seeing now is we're seeing, we're seeing this really interesting time in America where um, all these owners are looking at what their succession is gonna be and where um, the investment we're looking at uh, trying to understand what the investment models are for um, for public media. So what we're seeing right now is we're working, public media has been in this sort of weird uh, position now where um, we have suddenly found ourselves in the middle of a conversation about what will these newsrooms be and how will they, um, six, what will their ownership be going forward? These owners are focused on what is the succession? They only have a couple ways to sell at this point, and they're looking at what are the platforms and the ways that their um, that their enterprises can sustain community journalism. And so we've been looking at um, we've been looking at these um, we've been looking at these different ventures. We focused um, on uh, what was I going to say? We've actually um, been. Um, I just lost my train of thought. I apologize for that. <laughs> I have all been there. Let me start again. Succession, uh, local ventures. Succession and local ventures. So we have seen um, public media has been, we, we are at this point where um, public media has um, 
Boy, I've lost my train of thought again. Let me start again. Um, ownership. We're seeing a transition in ownership now um, where, let me focus again. So we are um, trying to understand how to evaluate these investments. So this is, this is the point. There's actually, there's this moment in time where we have an opportunity to make sure that we catch these falling organizations. As Elizabeth was just saying, and others are saying, there's media capture going on. Um, but there's a lot of different structures and then we need to understand how to do this. We need to evaluate these organizations. We're evaluating um, different entities in different markets. We've talked a lot about newspapers as an industry. Newspapers themselves are a business, a sustainable model that's been going for many years. Public media is also another sustainable model that has been going for many years. We need to continue to look at these different business models and how how they can work with each other. Um, what we saw last year was we saw an opportunity where an existing legacy business model and a public media model were merged in Chicago. There are many other opportunities where we're now seeing um, business owners who are looking at their papers and thinking, how do I move this into another model? Some of them are going to be partnerships with existing models. And some of them are going to be uh, sustainable on their own in new ownership models. The question for the group is, if you're looking at investing and supporting an organization in a market, you know, how do you understand that business model? How do you understand what's left there, what the dynamics of newspapers are, what the dynamics of uh, the market are? Um, how do you understand um, what are the collaborations and the other things in the market that will make sense to sustain that lo local journalism going forward? Um, and we've been looking in one market, we've been working uh, where we are looking at that type of um, partnership where we would move a uh, we would move a statewide newspaper into another ownership model that would actually be sustainable. Um, that may include impact investing, may include other things, um, may include collaboration with other media partners in the area. How do you create those environments where we're, we have enough collaboration that those uh, entities can continue? Um, and so it's been an interesting journey because I don't think we spend enough time on understanding, evaluating the business models and their future and the investment. We don't talk talk enough about sustainability. Um, I know we've talked all about it today, but we need to sort of embrace the sustainable models we already have and sort of leverage those as well. Um, and I, startup versus existing models, we need to there. Sorry. Thank you. No, it's the curse of the microphone. Yes, indeed. Zoe, do you want to give it a whirl or should I just give you this one? <laughs> Or, or sorry, I didn't know who it was. I was going by that. I'm sorry, Joanna, I didn't mean to skip you. I was just looking at the, okay, great. Sorry then, Joanna. Um, thank you, very, very interesting comments. Um, so I'm wondering where to start. Um, to give you a bit of context, um, <clears throat> the Namibia Media Trust is a nonprofit trust and uh, owner, 100% um, shareholder in a newspaper, a printing press, um, and since last year, a uh, radio station. Um, the Namibian, uh, the newspaper, the Namibian, uh, so you can see that there's a heavy, very heavy investment in print media. Firstly, the radio station only came off the ground last year. So um, the Namibian has an illustrious history in the sense that it was uh, established in 1995 with donor funding from the EU. Um, and took several years, um, and I think in 1996 became sustainable, a profitable business. Um, yes, but um, I, I refer to it as the triple whammy, uh, digitalization, um, a general economic downturn, and uh, COVID. Um, that was pretty much the final nail in the coffin. But so... Um, as a result, um, you saw in uh, 2020, a 37% retrenchment of staff in the newsroom um, on the, the part of the newspaper, about 42% at the printing press. 
Um, and as I mentioned, the radio station itself is, um, is, is very new and it has yet to realize the investment that was made, quite a substantial investment um, in 2021. So this is the challenge. Um, this is legacy media. And I mean, the, the, the best uh, sense of the word. Um, and for Namibia, this particular newspaper or this media house is of critical importance. It's, I mean, it, it's, it's part of the DNA of the country. It's very much part of the liberation movement um, of the country. So this is our challenge. Um, and I think the challenge here is about fully understanding sustainability and assisting the Namibian in all the media company, the group, uh, in terms of its transformation. Namibia is a huge, huge country with a very, very small population, only about 2.5 million people. Um, so, um, yeah, distances are vast. Um, so part of, you know, the innovation that has happened, and this is what uh, a result of COVID is that, um, you know, competitors have collaborated. Um, the Namibian or the NMT, uh, the trust is collaborating with its biggest opposition, the Namibian Media Holdings, um, in terms of a joint distribution mechanism. Um, so they have joint shareholding in a distribution company that gets the newspaper out. Um, I think in, in local terms, um, the advertising, um, I mean, that model has sailed, that ship has sailed, so forget about that. Um, and um, um, to date, the Namibian still doesn't have a paywall up. And my concern is that it's inevitable, but it probably won't change uh, that the dynamics much. So the real challenge is to fully understand um, what kind of um, you know diversification or business model will help uh, the sustainability of this news organization? I must say that <clears throat> COVID has taught us a lot. Um, the Me Too movement um, had its manifestations in Southern Africa as well. Um, in so uh, Southern Africa, you had the shuttered all down <clears throat> and, and many other movements. And I believe that um, the youth bulge that people refer to so often is potentially um, the saving grace for many uh, media organizations in Southern Africa, in the global South specifically. Um, but again, um, the innovation and the technology and the experiences, um, they are yet to be cultivated to fully understand how to make media sustainable. Um, and my concern is just that, um, what does sustainability really mean for the group going forward? And is it at all possible consider, uh, considering the numbers? Um, there's something else I think I wanted to mention. Um, I mean, we look often to um, the Daily Maverick and what it's doing is that um, audience engagement is, is critical. Um, but considering Namibia also um, with a very, very diverse audience, 13 different languages. Um, and uh, when, I mean, I am missing a very important conference where we are active. Uh, um, today on the fourth industrial revolution uh, on artificial intelligence. I don't think we've even made the third industrial revolution, but this is the concern at, at the moment. So um, yes, I mean, th this, this is a very, very difficult scenario in which I think uh, most medium-sized newspapers find themselves in um, the funding or the support to independent media um, and keep in mind for the Namibian editorial independence is um, that sacrosanct, um, and that's the model, and that's why uh, we've assumed this model. Um, so 
I lost my train of thought. <laughs> should we um should we go to Branco since he's next door and then let Joanna get the last word before questions? Oh. Would that be a good idea? Or did sure. you get your train? Oh, okay, no, let's continue. Yeah. As you wish. If you've got that train, go with it. Okay. I just want to say that Namibian does a phenomenal work and we yeah. actually republish lots of good stories from your side. Um, am I supposed to re respond to this question? Do whatever you want. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I was thinking about it and um, I, I can, if I can gauge our success um, in attracting investor confidence and secure capital is medium to low. So I'm not sure that uh, I actually can share um, the success story there. Um, before that, I just want to say that uh, uh, by far the greatest um, uh, funding partner is MDIF, and we are very thankful for that. And I'm grateful to meet Sasha as well today. It's just a wonderful occasion. Um, Daily Merrick was launched in 2009, and we had this idea that we can um, sell our advertising in the way that we used to do it in print. And then um, Facebook and Google happened and took away 95% of it. Um, so we, we found ourselves uh, like pretty much like a fish out of the water. We just, you know, gasping for air. And then um, um, next seven, eight years, we, we found every possible friend, pool and family, and we tapped them out. And then um, we were quite lucky in 2017 to do something called the Gupta Leaks, um, which helped us tremendously to um, gain um, kind of access to, to a lot of um, donor capital, but not the organized uh, foundations. I just want to tell that we are exceptionally unsuccessful in getting the money from uh, foundations like Ford and anybody else, uh, just zero. <laughs> um, so, um, we we realized that, um, and just to uh, respond to Sasha, um, I think Sasha is absolutely correct that every every investment in media is impact investment, and we actually trying to explain to people um, that um, they're not investing in us, they're not investing into a specific company, they're investing into their own future, and uh, um, you know, South African media and um, Khadija is here. She can share my, 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 uh, and a couple of my other friends here. Um, South African media is near collapse right now, and I try to explain to people the situation in South Africa right now, where uh, first two estates uh, failed completely, uh, judiciary is rapidly failing, and the media has failed around ninety percent. Uh, so basically, the scraps of media and the scraps of civil society holding the country, country together essentially. So. Um, you know, if I if I have any advice to give to the to the investors and uh, foundations and people who actually have money, is the rule of thumb would be that if the if the market is developed, if the national players are really strong, probably in Asia and definitely in in, in America, by by all means, please do invest into smaller local in, in, in uh, media deserts because that's where they, it's really important. Um, places like South Africa and a couple other uh, countries come to mind. Um, the desert is kind of the entire country, entire media. So probably the best investment would be in the in, uh, media companies that can actually um, hold the country together and bring about change. So it's really important the difference in between. So I just think it's really important to understand that different countries have different problems and different profiles of, of need. Um, what we've done, we 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 we're mixing. Um, well, officially we're for profit, but we will never make profit in our lives. I mean, that's just, <laughs> especially the reason why, there are two reasons for that. Uh, and the first and big reason is that uh, as as a, as a income has grown, we invested more and more into more people, into more courage, into growth. So we started as a five people outfit in 2009, we are 110 people uh, today. Um, and again, let me assure you that none of the, in intervening months, we have made any profit. <laughs> and but the reason is because we kept spending all the money that was coming in into, into more people. Um, we we have this um, incredible urgency in South Africa, and I'm sure you you you, you understand the situation as well in Namibia, where um, we don't have time. We don't have time to actually sit down and think about ourselves. We actually have to think about the country. 
Um, so, um, and if we don't do these things, um, unfortunately, nobody will. So, so we don't have a choice but to grow and to actually go into more media deserts. We're now um, ready to re reinvent the TV coverage um, because it's just not happening. So we have no choice. Bronco, you've been so... Sorry. Um, no, I think over the years, we've all appreciated your voice. And I will say that every time I see you, you're more depressing. Um, <laughs> which, but, you know, that's my temperament too. My motto is it can always get worse. Um, <laughs> so, Joanna, I'm so interested. There's must be so much in Poland. Obviously, threats to freedom of expression. Ukraine, uh, what... Tell us what you're doing and how you see the situation. Thank you. And then we'll take some questions if you leave us time, but not. Yes, as well. there is really little time for questions. So I would uh, try to be very brief, but, you know, with the multitude of subjects that you just mentioned, uh, yes, uh, the media capture in in Central Europe, or generally this illiberal democracy threat to, uh, to freedom of speech and independence independent media in general and Ukrainian uh, situation, which we are involved in as the newspaper, but also as the foundation that is uh, running together with the newspaper. Uh, so maybe I just want to say, um, like to begin with, is that I don't, I, it's difficult for me to talk as the last person because usually I talk as the first, this is my choice, so that I can t you know, say exactly what I plan to say. Now, after hearing all your voices, uh, I feel like I'm, I'm in a position of maybe, I don't know, summarizing or like you know, responding to everything, which would like take one hour because I found what you said extremely inspiring, but also uh, very much corresponding to, uh, uh, to, to the issues uh, that are very close to my heart, but are also very close to the methods of working of both the newspaper and mm, the organization, the Gustav Bodra Foundation I'm running, but also other organizations I'm very close with or have some kind of relationship with. So what I would like to say uh, first, maybe, um, is that I'm very happy to hear uh, this praise impact investment, uh, like underlining the fact that what is important in investing is not really making the uh, media organization, media outlet profitable, but to make it more impactful. This is very important when you have this, you know, uh, this, this, this line of thinking about media as public good. If you treat it as public good, then you don't think about profit as such. You think about having it sustainable. And then we talked about what does it mean? Sustainability and investing in capacity is so very important. You know, so often I, um, I'm faced with a situation that there are like multiple finan financial opportunities for media, also for smaller media in you know different regions of Europe, and they 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 love using these phrases, you know, innovation or like technology development. Fantastic, let's do that, right? You know, share with us technologies. But then at the end of the day, especially smaller media outlets I'm working uh, extensively with, um, they come to me and say, hey, but you know what? We, like our IT guy is our accountant at the same time. Mm -hmm. And basically, it's great to have this technological solution. But well, you know, after this like one day workshop, we are not able to use it. Right. And this is what is so very important to invest in human resources, to invest in people, but not like teaching them. This is something I had when I was last in Ukraine in Lviv and meeting um, local media outlets, which we are helping like financially, you know, to sustain this uh, super uh, horrible time. They they told us, but please promise us that you won't come here in six months with another workshop how to do you know impactful journalism because well I believe we know how to do that please could you come with seed money could you please come with technologies that we can actually use and with people maybe who would stay with us for half a year you know to 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 make this transformation real not just something you know very superficial so I think we all e are very eager to hear the questions, right? So maybe I'll just uh, leave it like this. And so I've got, thank you, Joanna. That was really interesting. I do actually want to hear all about what you're doing with Ukraine, but maybe you can tell me later. I've got a mic that works and I see people with questions. So see, Leon, I'm going to do one, two, three. And 
definitely mm -hmm. say your name. Uh, thank you so much. It's a great pleasure to be back here at Columbia. Uh, I was a student here, based in Minneapolis. I go back and forth in Sierra Leone, West Africa. So I'm taking right from Joanna's question. So you were talking about investing in human capital. So um, I've been doing media for a long time. So here in the state, we have uh, immigrant journalists, professional immigrant journalists, and African journalists who have been working across the continent and um, in the States as professional journalists. But coming back to the US, some of them were corresponding for BBC, um, New York Times, Reuters, but many are here in this country who came to this country, but they can't practice journalism. And at the same time, when they go back to Africa, uh, West Africa, where I'm coming from, they find it difficult to fit into those newsroom. So we started the Africa paper years back in Minneapolis, then the Africa Institute for International Reporting. So these guys are here with time. They said, you know what? The media is not changing. We had wanted to practice here, but we cannot get in into the newspapers, the newsrooms in the US. We can't fit in. So some of my friends from BBC, New York Times, who were correspondent AP, they gave up journalism. So how, how do you invest? How do you encourage them to say, OK, let's come back and continue working here? For example, we started the Africa paper solely in Minneapolis. The idea was to get African professional journalists who are based in Minneapolis and in the Midwest to work as newspaper journalists to cover those communities. But with time, they started many left. So some of us still continue to be there. Then we started the Institute to train and encourage some of them. But again, it becomes complicated. They say, you know what, this is not working. So how do you encourage those guys with all those talents in this country to continue working as professionals and to continue covering those um, um, uh, communities? Yeah. Hi, um, thank you for this very insightful talk. Um, I'm Padma Priya. I'm the co-founder and editor-in-chief of Suno India. We are a fairly new platform and we only produce podcasts in five different Indian languages, including English. Um, and we basically are trying to encourage audio journalism because we also feel that it sort of breaks the barrier of literacy. Um, one of the questions that I have, and you know, we are being funded currently by um, a media foundation back in India, um, and we've been trying to, you know, this is what we do all our time is we write grants, you know, apart from doing reporting work and, you know, um, managing and, you know, you know, writing a editorial strategy as co-founders, all we're doing is hunting for money is like, how do we constantly keep this thing going? And, you know, we are all at this, you know, a lot of people are talking about, you know, um, you know, like how uh, Brand could spoke about in South Africa, they, they're at a critical point. It's the same in India. We're at a critical point as, you know, as journalists, as, you know, at press freedom, at censorship, at so many levels. So, um, but then every time we speak to funders, we are also, you know, especially from abroad, we are also being told that, oh man, like it's so difficult to get money into India because of regulations. So what are we supposed to do? Like we established as a for-profit so that it would be easier because an, an NGO is even tougher. Um, so, you know, I'm just trying to sort of, you know, maybe hope that you all can brainstorm among yourself and see how you can support as Indian independent journalists. And a couple of us are here from India. Um, and I know that it's it's the same struggle for a lot of us um, because there is also an active um, sort of a attempt to curb these voices that are there. Like the foundation that supports us was raided by the income tax yesterday, just sort of to set the context. So um, yeah, I mean, what can we do more, you know, apart from writing grants and you know, how do we convince you to give us money also? <laughs> That's a great question, Padman. I've been wondering whether being a for-profit would be easier. I think we'll take a question from Leon and then let the uh, floor answer. Uh, thanks, Anya. Uh, I'm Leon, Free Press Unlimited. Um, I want to quote Branko, who uh, was in a panel in Perugia a couple of months ago. So correct me if I'm quoting you wrong, but you said, we're going to be endless talking in panels like this for the next 10 years. The only difference will be that we'll all be poorer by that time. So my question to you is actually, it's correct, right? 
<laughs> and I, I thought it was a great quote, and I, I, I will quote you more. Um, so my question is this. To me, after 15 years by now in media development, it is clear to me that no matter what we do in terms of our own capacity, our own development, the media market is not functioning. And the liberal idea of a competitive market has gone out the door. So my challenge to the, those in the panel who have funds is who of you is willing and able to fund reform of the media market? Because that, in my view, is the only systemic level change that we need. Despite all the good efforts that are here, and we think we are part of all those good efforts as well, we need a different economic enabling environment for the media. Who's willing to fund that, that effort? Nice. I will retrieve it. Thank you. OK, I think anybody want to answer any of these excellent and tough questions? I don't have any money, sorry, but absolutely. But um, I, I think what we need, we need um, um, really new thinking. We need to revolutionize our thinking and actually stop thinking small. And uh, that's, I, you know, um, I, I had a meeting with a representative of one of the biggest global aid, uh, you know, foundations a few weeks ago. And he told me that um we love what you do we can't help you with anything um but if you need my personal help i'll be able to help you and i, I really didn't need help personally um I, I think really we need to start thinking brave and bold um the one thing that you can quote me on as well is that the bad guys are organizing across the borders what is wrong about us organizing across the borders globally because guys this is not a south african fight and a Libyan fight or Central European fight. This is the global fight. This is the fight against uh, the forces that really want to ruin our civilization. And I am personally really tired of having to go granular where the problem is global. Okay. And yes, uh, let, me, let me give it to you. We need between five and $10 billion a year to fund the free media, which can actually fight this incredible disinformation storm, hurricane, which is now engulfing the whole planet. You know, it's a lot of money, but comparing to how much we lose and how many trillions are lost every year to that, it's nothing. And I keep, well, just one thing is that media is the cheapest investment into any democracy anywhere in the world. Yeah, yeah. Um, just Thanks, Ronko. Um, just my five cents. Um, I wanted to add that, um, yes, we need to think more creatively and more constructively uh, around the issue, but we need to consider that we need to um, have a broader view of the media ecosystem um, in the sense that um, good journalism plays a particular role, but it's not journalism alone that is playing that role. Um, we find all over a shrinking civic space. Uh, the media support organizations are falling apart. So um, we need to look broader. We need to look at the broader environment in which those media organizations are operating. Because, I mean, look at the example of Maria Ressa. Rappler is doing very well economically, but they may tomorrow not be able to operate. Yeah. So, yeah, just... Uh, I'm keeping a close eye. I know there's a lot more questions and there's a couple panelists. So Sasha and then Tracy, yeah. I'll just try to say three sentences. I 100% agree that we need to think about reinventing the whole system. The system it, that it works does not work now. I 100% agree that we have to stop thinking small. Uh, staying within the <clears throat> confines of nonprofit world is thinking small. All the nonprofit world, all of the foundations current or present, and multiply that with 10, still is just a sliver of the funds that is needed. And we have to create an ecosystem in which we can actually get commercial funds in. 
and we have to find a way of coexistence of nonprofits that are taking the biggest part of the risk and commercial funds, and that's the only way, and reform all the others, like schools, journalism schools, so, you know, we have to stop this uh, uh, obsession with newsroom, right? We tell, tell, if does any one of you know who is the best media manager in Europe, in Africa, in Asia? We don't even know the name, right? We don't celebrate them. We do not know who is the best technologist who creates products that are actually sellable to, to clients. So that all has to be rethought. I, um, I do want to plug our conference on October 21st because we're going to be looking at funds. We're going to be looking at laws. We're going to be looking at the news media bargaining code. So the whole point of that is to bring foundations to come in and think about the big picture solution. So if you want to attend, let me know. Um, I think we had Tracy, Sharon, and then I saw several people in the audience. Uh, yes, great. So just real quickly, um, I think... The answer to your question, your question, uh, these are all along the same lines. And I want to send a challenge out to the donor community, especially in the U.S. You have got to learn how to share power. That is what this comes down to. The affluent, the elite class has the power. And so when it comes to people who look like you, who look like me, we need to have, we need to have some of that power. So we have to speed and push and again that's sort of the thing is persuade these donors, persuade for me to be to um, look outside of their closed networks. Yeah, I know you're going to find your friends. But there are some people who are not even in the network who need to be funded as well. Um, when we look at how, how advertising works, and I, that's a whole other topic, but I mean, you have advertisers who won't advertise on BIPOC sites because they talk about race. That's a problem. So we have to push the industry to be more inclusive and more reflective, but at the, at the, again, at the very bare minimum. You know, our slogan is shifting power in journalism. Somebody said, say share, Tracy, because that's nicer. That makes people feel better. But this is about shifting power. And so that's my challenge to funders. <laughs> I'm not sure I can follow that one. That was pretty good. Um, I just want to say a couple of things about you for the grant writing, because I, I think and and let me wrap a few things together here. The ecosystem needs to change because I think we're, oh, we're going to experiment. We're going to try new things. What we are saying to people, and I see all these people coming to us for support, is I now am starting a nonprofit news organization. I need grant money. I need, I'm going to go do membership models. And we have put all of our eggs in a couple of baskets. And that's the message that goes out to everybody who's trying to do something. Um, there are way too many audience. No one's going to pay for all of these things. The audience membership models are great. It's a tiny percentage of your readership who, or, or your viewership who is going to pay for anything. It's not a sustainable model. It's a sustainable model for a few big organizations, but it really isn't. We have too many organizations in niche areas. And I think also we need to sort of remember that we're the, the fantasy See that people used to pay for news, I think, is a fantasy. And I think to your point, what people paid for, I got my cooking, I got my crossword puzzle, all of these things that were the bundled together. You weren't actually paying for the stuff that we now think people should pay for. And so rethinking what is a news organization? What am I serving? Is it just journalism? Are there other things that I am doing? Um, and what other auxiliary services to some extent? So we need the big systemic change, but we also can't wait for it to try to figure out how to do things on, on an individual level. And by the way, the membership model myth is totally the fault of the donors. I was appalled when I would go to conferences in Africa and see Americans telling people from low-income countries, oh, just sell memberships. I was offended every time. <laughs> okay, go for it, Allison, and then Jan. Oh, thanks. I did have a question a few minutes ago, and I was listening, so I forgot I had a question. Um, I, um, I work for a community foundation, the Delaware Community Foundation. We're a small place-based foundation, and we are constantly pushing our applicants to collaborate. 
And I'm wondering if any of you as funders think about collaboration opportunities among yourselves. One of the things we've been trying to do is get a bunch of our local funders and corporations to at least consider moving to a single application so that um, we can get, you know, we and Delaware's small, we should be able to pull this off, but, you know, can we get 15 small foundations to come up with a single application so that all of us are not then doing 15 different applications. I wondered if that was something on the ground. That's a great idea. And I know that's something Mark has worked on for years as well as Mira. Um, Leon and then Mira. Oh, and the woman in the back, yeah. yeah. Okay, Jan Lublinski, I work for DW Academy for Deutsche Welle and I, in my department, we discuss a lot of strategies on how to support through our partners in developing countries, newsrooms and NGOs. And I'm, I'm really impressed by this discussion because I see so many good strategies, starting from looking at marginalized groups and what can be done, uh, you know, capacity development of organizations. And there's so many th important things mentioned. But at the end, we now got into the discussion of the political side of this. And my impression is that we need to engage the journalists to, to, to make their own case, their political case of their own media environment. And I think we need to find ways to encourage journalists to actually take their stance and, and shape the political and legal environment they're working in. And my question is, is it conceivable that this can also be funded so that, that actually journalists don't only get wrapped up in fact-checking exercises you know, paid for by, by the platforms, but that instead they actually do, you know, have time to engage politically and advocate for for a new order for the media. I think that would help much more than, than many of the small funding of, of, you know, of certain types of reporting or just give, handing out trainings. But I think in addition with all the things you mentioned, there's a political advocacy side to this that needs to be strengthened. Uh, I'll say my comments for the breakout session. Um, we are working on several things that were mentioned. So what I would like us to do in the breakout session is to uh, have recommendations exactly like that one from the side of media companies, uh, how grantees uh, and media companies can come together uh, to have more access to both funding and uh, uh, investment. Thing. And on Branco's point, I would have so much to say, but yes, we do need more support for strong advocacy for the sector and getting together uh, across the borders. I think we have one more. Thank you. Uh, continuing the political side. Um, I represent some of that online. It's a technology and a news platform that unblock um, blocked medias from Russia, Ukraine, and Belarus. So basically what do we do? We deliver blocked news articles and all of the materials that um, Russian, Ukrainian, Belarusian um, uh, mass media produce, but they can't reach these readers because they're obviously blocked. So what we do, um, uh, we... Uh, uh, we kind of this anti-censorship anti platform. And what my question is, how do you investors, how do you define the censorship itself? Because it's quite interesting question. Some sites and medias are blocked, they're considered the um, um, whatever terroristic and um, um, anti-country medias. At the same time, uh, some pro-Kremlin uh, medias are blocked here. So in, um, you cannot read some for example, Russian sites here. So of course we, we work on the good side, right? We unblocking Medusa and um, Belsat and most of the Russian, Ukrainian, Belarusian prohibited sites. But I'm just wondering how do you define censorship? Uh, it's mostly a philosophical question, but still, thank you. Thank you. Those were all um, fantastic questions. And I like that our audience really challenged our panel to think big, to think bold, to think more along the lines of the huge political crisis facing much of the world. So that was um, super interesting. I've been told that we're going into a breakout now. So well, um, actually, it's time for lunch now. Okay, uh, I'm going to so, let you take over. All right. Well, well for, thank you so much to everybody for that really lively discussion, and I think it will feed very nicely into the the post-lunch session where maybe we can start to make some policy and come up with some real 
concrete recommendations uh, or at least a wish list of things to do. Um, so the idea is this. Uh, it's it, We've gone a little bit over time, but that's fine. It's quarter past now. I suggest we reconvene here at two o'clock. Lunches are in the back. Those lovely looking lunch boxes await you on the table there. I think they're filled with caviar and, and, and other, possibly not quite, <laughs> gluten-free caviar. Um, could I just get a show of hands of how many people are intending to come back at two o'clock to take part in these breakout sessions? How? So, okay, good. It's a good number of people. Fantastic. So when we come back, we'll divide you up basically into an appropriate number of groups to tackle um, recommendations. But we'll explain all of that when we when we come back. I think it's probably the easiest way. What do you think, Mira? Do you, do you want to do it now? Yep. Yeah, okay. Act two. So please feel free to stay here or go outside or wherever you like, but let's meet back here at two o'clock. And thank you again to our uh, moderator, Anya, and to all our speakers. And thanks to you in the audience and everybody watching. Have a good lunch.